My name is Martin Tugwell. I'm the program director for England's Economic Heartland. Um, I'm also a, uh, uh, a trustee of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation, so it's particularly nice to be in the CIHT uh, uh, arena here. Um, I'm going to be joined uh, during the course of this briefing by two of my colleagues working on the Strategic Alliance. That's James Golding Graham, who's sitting here at the back, uh, who takes the lead on the innovation work stream. But I'm also going to be joined by Steve Kent, uh, who's working on behalf of our delivery partners as part of the collaborative approach. Um, we're going to take this is really kind of a bit of a, an information just feeding out and briefing you on uh, uh, on what we're doing, where we are with our program, what's happening, and particularly on the innovation and the delivery side, because that seems to be areas of, of, of interest. Um, and if you have questions, then there's an opportunity just to have a chat through with those uh, at the end. So let's see how we get on and, and hopefully um, it'll help uh, give you a bit of a sense of where we are. Um, if you're not familiar with England's economic heartland, we're the third of the sort of emerging subnational transport bodies. There's a fourth that's just about forming now as well. You've got Transport for the North, you've got Midlands Connect, ourselves, and Transport for the South East. Um, the area we cover, the core of it, is primarily from, um, uh, from Oxfordshire across to Cambridge, from Northamptonshire down to Luton. But as we start to look at where are the, the joint synergies in terms of working, we're also looking at how we can draw uh, stronger linkages with our colleagues in Swindon, with Hertfordshire, and even across to uh, Suffolk and Norfolk, particularly when some of our key infrastructure, particularly the big strategic infrastructure, stretches over quite a wider area. I think it's worth kind of reflecting on where it started. The drive for this was very much from the political leaders. Uh, the political leaders of three county councils came together and very quickly there was common interest and common agenda across a much wider area. So it's focusing around the local transport authorities, the strategic authorities, working very much with the local enterprise partnerships and our delivery partners, but increasingly we're working with the local planning authorities particularly as we start to get into the detail of what the transport strategy might mean, what might be the priorities, and recognising that it's an iterative process. You can't do transport without planning and vice versa. The key thing in all of this, though, is to say this is about building truly collaborative working, and it takes time. So the, uh, the initial idea for this was nearly three years ago, and, and it's taken time for the political leaders to get the uh, the confidence and the, the working together to actually get us to a place where we're now starting to accelerate. Going back to the origin, origins of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the alliance then, why did it come about? And it really was three key areas that struck the political leaders as being areas of common interest. One was that simple observation that a lot of strategic infrastructure, east-west rail, the expressway, stretches across more than one area. So it makes sense to talk to each other and work together. There was a recognition that there were actually some uh, issues of, of common interest, challenges, opportunities to, do, to work together across boundaries. So again, why wouldn't you do that? And thirdly, there was a recognition three years ago that actually we needed a stronger voice. Uh, this isn't to say we're in competition with Transport for the North or Midlands Connect or even Transport for South East, our colleagues uh, here as well. It, it's recognising that you need to have a strong strategic voice to be able to engage with government, to be able to make sure the priorities and the issues for that area can be, um, can be discussed and, and, and prioritised. So it's sharing that uh, recognition of common agendas and a common purpose about how do we deliver the economy and the economic opportunities. And that's one of the key drivers here. It's what are we trying to achieve? It's about the growth in the economy, making ourselves able to compete uh, on, our, on our global stage. Because although the area we cover is relatively prosperous and relatively successful, if you compare ourselves to places in the Far East or on uh, the, the, in, uh, to the West, you know, we're still not as competitive in productivity terms as them. Just a sort of few facts and more facts and figures about the Alliance area. Um, three and a half million people roughly, uh, uh, an economy worth about 92 and a half billion, um, and it's a net contributor to the, uh, to the Exchequer. That means we're generating wealth that allows investments, not only in our part of the world, but also allows investments in other parts of the country. And the way we look at it is just like any business. If you don't keep investing in that, you're going to go backwards. It's not a question of you stagnate. You actually go backwards in competitive terms. So that comes back to one of the key 
drivers politically as to why this was important for the political leaders and the business leaders. That message that you need to keep investing, not just to protect what you've got, but to actually be able to grow beyond that. So that comes quite nicely to sort of trying to set out the scale of the ambition that the, that the, the uh, political leaders and the business leaders had. It's about improving productivity. It's about creating this sense about a place to invest uh, and this emphasizing about, it's not just about building more houses or getting more jobs. It's about creating a place, a sense of place, creating a better quality of place moving forward. Because one of the attractions for uh, uh, the, uh, the Heartland area is indeed the fact the quality of the environment, the quality of the built environment, but also the quality of the natural environment. And we need to keep protecting those, but also using them as an opportunity to, for, for success into the future. A driver as well is about the fact of strategic leadership. And again, going back to this point about a strategic voice, a powerful voice that can engage with government. The journey that the leader started was began three years ago. Um, the last 18 months, the area has had the, uh, the benefit of a national study led by the National Infrastructure Commission. The then Chancellor commissioned the NIC back in March of 2016 to look at how to realize the economic opportunities and potential of this part of the country. They published their interim report last November um, they are scheduled to publish their final report this November, probably sometime uh, closer to the, the budget. There were some important messages, though, that came out of the, uh, the interim report last November. One was about the potential of this corridor, recognising it is a truly globally competitive area in terms of its potential and the opportunities it has in terms of its universities, its skills and the clusters that already exist. And it went as far as to suggest that um, the scale of that potential is such that our current 92.5 billion economy could grow in 30 years by between 80 to another 85 to 163 billion a year. So it's either tripling or doubling the size of the economy from what it is at the moment. Huge potential, huge opportunity, and really the response to the NIC's interim report uh, in last year's autumn statement was an, a, an acceptance and a recognition by the government that if you're talking about the long-term future of the UK economy, this is a fundamental part of it. Um, London and other parts of the country are equally important, but this is going to be one of the key drivers for uh, the, the longer-term UK economy. It doesn't take a genius, though, to recognise if you're going to double or triple the size of the economy. That's a, scale, that's a seismic change. That's a transformational change in the economy. And it means we're going to have to be smart. We're going to have to be smarter about how we invest. We're going to have to have some investment in some big kit. Um, the issue about connectivity, the fact that it is actually very difficult, you can do it, but it's not very easy, to get across from one side of the corridor to the other. In some instances, it's, it's actually perversely uh, easier to go into London and then come back out, which seems to be crackers in terms of both the journey for the individual, but also has implications for how the transport system works in London. And indeed, if you look at the, the recent uh, draft transport strategy by the London Mayor, he was identifying how if you can transfer some of the through freight services from London away from the city, from the, the, uh, the, 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 the city you might actually be able to use some of the capacity on the rail network to support even more passenger movement. So this is about how do we look at the, uh, the scale of the opportunity from improving connectivity. But we're not going to just do it with traditional approach. We're not going to do it by just investing in more kit and being, even if we're smarter at how we invest that, it's still going to be a, a, a transformation is going to be needed in the way businesses operate. And remembering, yes, it's nice to be associated with uh, the fact that seen as potentially the equivalent of the Silicon Valley, but we'd like to think that actually we'll be the 21st century equivalent or the next generation for uh, the economy uh, in a global uh, environment. What we've got is we've got effectively a once in a generation opportunity. Not very often do you get the chance to build a completely new spine that combines a rail and a road corridor with connections around it to the urban areas surrounding. We don't get the opportunity to do that very often. 
even less often do you get the kind of uh, in, in principle support from Treasury to actually make the investment to make that happen as soon as possible. So we've got some good foundations on which to build and we're building on those foundations by providing strategic leadership. So the Strategic Alliance came together, like-minded political and business leaders recognizing the need, recognizing the opportunities that we had to exploit and recognizing that the key here is about strategic leadership, taking that longer term view, recognizing that you need to address short term problems and issues locally, but recognizing that they need to be put in the context of a bigger strategic uh, approach. So it's not just about transport, it's also about how do we build upon the digital connectivity that's there, use some of the opportunities that we're going to make investments in infrastructure to act as improvements for uh, conduiting uh, to digital infrastructure. It's how do we make the environment for utilities, delivering the power, the generation, the water, the other utility supplies that are actually fundamental to that place-shaping agenda. Because some of the wicked issues there are actually lying in how do things operate at a national level and how those then impact about delivery at the local level. And fundamental to this as well is about working with our representatives in, in, in the Palace of Westminster. So uh, we have the benefit already of an east-west rail or party parliamentary group and we're looking about how we can build upon that and turn it into a heartland or party parliamentary group so that we can work with and look to support from our local MPs as we keep this momentum moving. Turning into a few more practical things now, this kind of sets the scene in terms of how we came about, what the drivers were, what the opportunities. In real practical terms, what we've done already it's now nearly 18 months ago, we set up our strategic transport forum. So the leaders, the business leaders, recognizing we needed this single forum in which we could start to have the strategic conversation. Currently, the, uh, the terms of reference for this have been re uh, reviewed and, and, and updated in light of experience, because after 18 months, um, we've moved on, we've developed our ideas, we've developed our partnerships. We've got a stronger clarity even more about where we need to move forward and what the, the, the right issues are. We also want to make sure that we have the right partners around the table. So if those le economic linkages with places like Hertfordshire and Swindon require them to be part of the partnership, we need to get them around the table to start shaping that program and driving it forward. So we're building on what we've got. We're also building on some of the immediate priorities that um, very, very easily were identified last autumn. We took the view, we knew the interim report from the National Infrastructure Commission was coming. We knew that there was going to be an autumn statement. We were trying to anticipate the question of if uh, number 11 Downing Street said to us, what are your top five absolute priorities? You know, there's always going to be more opportunities to invest and there's money available, but where are your real top five uh, opportunities and your top five uh, things that you want us to focus on? It was relatively simple and relatively easy to get, be clear what those strategic issues are. Firstly, delivering East-West Rail. There's a lot of progress being made on that. Um, secondly, making sure that we get this momentum around the expressway. Recognizing that it's very good having these strategic connections, but actually how do you take the uh, opportunities to connect those strategic uh, routes into the local networks? The sort of thing we talk about being first mile, last mile, connectivity. Now there's some ideas and some activity being uh, promoted by the National Infrastructure Commission in places like Milton Keynes, Cambridge, Oxford and Northampton. But we want to build upon those and we want to transfer the knowledge and experience to other places, other hubs like Bedford, Luton, Peterborough, Aylesbury. These are the kind of places where we need to be using that experience and that approach. And using the fact that these are going to be connected to that multimodal spine and how do we build upon it. Um, we've been working at the time very closely with the major road network study team, the team that was led by the Reese Jeffries Road Fund, and we could see instantly how that was an important part of our transport strategy moving forward. So we were advocating 12 months ago that it needed to be picked up, it needed to be part of the transport strategy, and it needed to be recognised by government. And following on from that, we were saying, and it's no good just having the network if you haven't got the mechanism for actually investing in it. So the more recent announcement about the, the principle of delivering uh, and implementing um, the National Roads Fund so that it can cover investment both in the national road network but also the uh, major road network is something that we've been very supportive of. And we look forward to responding to the consultation that's coming later this year. 
a little bit more detail about some of those priorities in a bit more detail. Strategic rail priorities, um, mentioned East West Rail, but if we're starting to look about where are the next blockages, the Didcot Oxford corridor, very important for connecting some of our science and technology centres, uh, not just in Oxfordshire, but across into the broader area, but also fundamentally important for places our colleagues in transport for the southeast, access from the southern ports. It's really important coming up through that corridor, thinking about how that investment then has an impact on the road corridor, which parallels it. Longer term, well, actually, probably in the medium term, once we have East West Rail in place, once we have HS2 in place, the opportunity to start developing this corridor that links Northampton, Milton Keynes, down through Aylesbury into uh, High Wycombe and then on to Old Oak Common and Park Royal. If you're not familiar with what's being proposed in, in London, and there's no reason why you should, um, Old Oak Common Park Royal is a 65,000 job, 20,000 home regeneration centre. I think the easiest way, if you've, if you've ever visited Stratford in the east, people often refer to it as being the Stratford for the west. But it's going to be even more uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, opportunities that arrives, not least of which because it will be an interchange between uh, this new corridor, High Speed 2, the Great Western Main Line, Heathrow Express and Crossrail. This is going to be a major hub interchange, not just for London, not just for ourselves in the heartland, but actually beyond uh, and into the rest of the country. And then we start looking at places like Cambridge with fast growth. So recently had a, a new station opened at Cambridge North, but aspirations for a, st a station at the south uh, of Cambridge next to some of the high tech industries and, and pharmaceutical research there. Hopefully that's going to start being picking up in, in terms of investment programs. So we're starting to be very clear about what are the real strategic priorities. But once you start having the infrastructure, you need to think about the franchising, how those that piece of infrastructure is going to be used moving forward. So that's where our engagement in uh, future rail franchises, the picture there is of uh, the current East Midlands Trains operator, which is one of the first franchises that we're looking at. And it's a really good example of how, uh, if you've heard people over the course of these two days talk about subnational transport bodies, really good example of how they are being used to feed in local priorities into the franchising specification. So we've now started to work with the franchising team to see how we can make sure the local priorities, the priorities of our partners are better reflected in the franchise specification, building on some of the experience that Midland Connect have had with the similar franchise. On the roads, those of you who know this part of the world will know the picture at the top there as being our favourite favorite road scheme at the moment, which is the Black Cat Roundabout on the A428. A major bottleneck and probably one of the first bits of the expressway be delivered. It's a RIS-1 commitment, which means we will start to see works on site within the next 18 months or so. They had a consultation earlier this year about the preferred route. The response to that will come fairly shortly. As a region, we had three out of the six strategic studies in RIS-1 impacting on our area. We had the expressway from Oxford to, uh, to uh, Cambridge. We had the A1 east of England from the M25 up to uh, Peterborough. And we had uh, elements of the M25 southwest quadrant, although actually it's probably, uh, that's a study that, it's probably really three regions if you include London as a region. It's, it's kind of on the cusp of the, the three of us. And, what we want to see now is some of those strategic studies being taken into the investment. So we've got good news with the expressway about the commitment there. Um, we need to see the, the, the commitment to move into investment for the A1. And we need to see some of the activity around the M25 Southwest Quadrant being translated into activities. Beyond that, at the moment, we're saying there's some, you know, there will be local schemes that we need to invest in, but the strategic objectives are going to have to come from our work on the major, no, major road network. The major road network as a study was actually, I think, launched here last year at Highways uh, UK 2016. This is the map that covers, or part of the map that covers the, the Heartland area. This is a starting point. It reflects the fact that actually at the moment, as we can see quite clearly, there aren't that many uh, roads connecting across the Heartland area. Lots of ro radial routes coming up and down from London, demonstrating the importance of the expressway and acting as a catalyst for change. And it's that catalyst for change, which means that when it comes to the major road network, whilst this will be a starting point, 
we need to start thinking very carefully about how the expressway, how the east-west rail route will start to change people's travel behaviour. If you can get from Oxford to Cambridge by train in about an hour or 10 minutes, if you can get across that corridor in about an hour and 15, hour 20 by road, you are going to start changing the nature of the housing markets, you're going to start changing the nature of the economical, uh, functional economic areas. That's going to have to be reflected in how we identify the major road network, and that's going to have to be reflected in the investment priorities that we move taking forward. So what we're doing at the moment is we're using the work with the expressway and the, probably the follow-on work as uh, part of the transport strategy to look at some of the key issues. So we need to look at what we call the, the missing link between Oxford and Milton Keynes. Is it an investment in one corridor or more than one corridor? If we look at the section from uh, Milton Keynes across to Cambridge, yes, we'll get the Black Cat uh, roundabout uh, relieved, but it's more than just that investment. There are pressures around Cambridge, there will be pressures around some of the junctions in the Cambridge area where we need to think about what the future is moving forward. I've touched on about the major road network and I've touched on about East West Rail. We need to integrate that thinking with our thinking on the major road network and recognise that by ch improving the East West connectivity, we will also improve North South connectivity. We will have an impact on uh, routing of, of vehicles there, which if you uh, have been following some of the uh, infrastructure um, uh, a challenge work over in, in the hub uh, which we've just been uh, making the, the awards on the prizes there you'll see that some of the ideas coming forward now about how we build upon some of the existing traffic and road work systems like Elgin and how do we start to use those as, to create a better environment for user information about how the road network is being operated. The year ahead or the year at the moment and the years ahead um, are very challenging they're very full um, in terms of the current year where our program is, is jointly funded by contributions from our local partners and funding from uh, the DFT. It's focusing around the national investment programs. Now is a moment of opportunity with uh, rail franchising and the high level output specification for investment. The national road investment program, the road investment strategy, we need to make sure our immediate priorities are reflected in that. And we've got this activity around innovation, which James is going to go into a bit more detail about shortly, as well as at the same time moving forward on our proposal to develop a sub-national transport body. Our colleagues in Transport for the North will shortly become a statutory body. Um, Midlands Connect and ourselves have very made it very firm that we want to make a commitment towards moving uh, towards a statutory body in due course. Probably going to take about 18 months, two years to have in place have it in place alongside the transport strategy and I'm sure that it, our colleagues in transport for the southeast will be looking at similar uh, challenges and opportunities moving forward. So over the next three years it's quite a packed program it comes down to one slide but there's a hell of a lot of work in there and if we just focus on the strategic agenda then actually it's about the collaboration and the connecting of uh, discussions so that you have a consistent message moving forward. That's going to be really quite, uh, uh, quite a challenge. But by this time next year, we'll hope I'll have our draft transport strategy in place, going out to consultation. We'll hope to have the initial views around the subnational transport body uh, to really move forward, and we'll then take that forward into the, the subsequent years. Our key challenges then, kind of trying to wrap up those last 15 or 20 minutes into sort of a one summation, is the driver in all of this is the economy recognizing how important it is to support businesses, not just because businesses need, are looking to be successful, but because a successful economy generates the, the value that allows the public sector more generally to support the services that uh, allow uh, 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 local services to be protected and, and maintained. And it's recognizing that our, um, our economy is not just around the cities, our economy is around the, S, the small and medium-sized enterprises that are actually quite widely dispersed across the whole of the corridor area. One of the things we're keen to do is to be really clear about what our priorities are so that we can work differently with the private sector. And this isn't about how can we get more money from the planning process necessarily. How can we have a genuinely different conversation with big scale, large scale international infrastructure providers who are looking for a commitment and a vision that goes over 20, 30, maybe 40 years. That for me is when we start to talk about new ways of funding. That's when we start to get into some interesting territory. And we're only going to do that if we look beyond traditional 
planning and infrastructure frameworks and start to think about all those elements that make a truly uh, place-shaping agenda. And at the heart of that is, in effect, transforming the, the role of the public sector. It's been a delight to be uh, setting a challenge for the infrastructure hub because it really does reinforce the importance of the fact that by providing some vision and some leadership, there is a world of talent and innovation and in entrepreneurs out there who are just waiting and itching to actually unleash their ideas and their opportunities to how we can actually solve some of our problems.